Hello, hello, listeners. Thank you for joining us here at The Bible Never Said That, a podcast where we discuss sayings that society and even the church like to say, but that miss the mark theologically. My name is Shara Donahue, and today we are discussing the popular saying, it's about the journey, not the destination. I know, I know, people love the saying, and I get the heart of it, but believers have the joy of living with the hope of heaven, and we need not diminish the greatness of that destination by saying it's all about the journey. This is a both-and situation. The journey helps us find Christ and be transformed into His likeness, but the destination means being with Him and His people forever in perfect, unbroken fellowship. In the words of some of the voices from my childhood, Bill and Ted, you could have a most excellent adventure and still end up in a bogus place. But society likes to elevate the journey because many believe the destination is a hole in the ground. End of story. But those who know Christ know that this is not the reality of our final destination. All the journeys we take do matter, but they will all lead us to one of two eternal destinations. And the choice of receiving the forgiveness and righteousness of Christ determines your ultimate destination. Will it be heaven? Or will it be hell? There is a reason Christians should share their faith. We get persuaded by fear and worldly pressure to keep it quiet and don't realize that in doing so, we don't share with people the most important information they could ever hear. When we really believe the gospel and love others, we will share our faith because we know the destination for every soul matters. Every soul has worth, and every soul will spend eternity with God or without Him. In Matthew 25, 46, Jesus says, after talking about the importance of caring for those in need, that after they walk their journey of meeting or ignoring need, that everyone is headed one of two directions. Jesus says, and I quote, Then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. Oh man. I mean, it feels harsh, but we can't ignore a truth just because it's hard. Instead, we need to see it for what it is, a part of God's perfect plan to have love, mercy, and justice coexist in perfect ways. When we get so focused on the journey of life, Without keeping the destination in mind, our view of God lessens. Our desire to know Him more wanes. We begin to lean towards finding satisfaction here on earth instead of remembering at the end of it all, we get to be with God. One of the ways we can keep our focus on heaven while still thriving in our daily life is to keep the wonder of our faith alive. There is a mystery to this vast universe that is beyond what we can explain, and we were made to revel in that. This mystery is more majestic and terrifying than anything that can be bound by our thoughts, and yet it still feels intimate. So intimate that many have heard this knowable yet unknown calling to their hearts and souls. And what a joy it is when blinded eyes finally begin to see that the longing was always there to lead them to the Almighty God. But we have to learn how to truly enjoy God, or we have a smaller grasp of the joys heaven will hold. Over time, Christians are tempted to forget the awe and wonder first ignited by their faith. For many, It is not an obvious temptation, but a slow progression. It begins in the heart. Worship becomes a little easier to critique. Sermons are often scrutinized. And the joy of sharing the hope we have in Christ Jesus becomes more chore than celebration. And we'll never understand it all until we get there. 
But in the here and now, on our way to our final destination, God wants his children to enjoy him. He wants us to delight in him as he delights in us. He is not a taskmaster, but a sovereign savior who has loved us with the purest form of love. However, there are times in life when he feels distant and far from being the one who knows our hearts and souls better than we know our own. In these times, the journey seems like the end-all be-all. We seek joy, then lose it, because we search for it in places that offer little in comparison to that which is found in God's presence. So what can we do? Today I want to discuss some practices that help us experience joy as we treasure Christ. The first thing we can do is to bask in the glory of the gospel daily. In the revealing of God's mercy, we find the freedom and forgiveness our souls need to rejoice. Even when we do not purposely reflect on the fallenness of our nature and our own propensity to sin, we always know it's there. But by His grace, we can also grasp the truth that Christ covered it all the moment we asked Him to save us. He cleansed our sin-stained soul. The more we become aware of what separates us from God, the more we get to know Him. Our enjoyment of Him starts in the truth of Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we take our eyes off ourselves and place them on Jesus. Where we once saw only failure, we now see His forgiveness and freedom. When we submit our will to the one who created us, the never-ending splendor of God's glory is more evident. And once our eyes are on Him as the answer, we need to tell God what we've been afraid to tell Him. We bring Him our doubts, fears, and the questions that linger. Then we ask Him for help. We ask Him to comfort and ask Him to teach We can't hide these things because it obscures our view of God. When we try to make it so He can't see us, it is only we who lose sight of Him. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. We will have questions. Doubt will try to take hold. And if we refuse to let Scripture take us back to truth— If we begin to withdraw from the local church out of fear that they will see our struggle or that our questions will spread, we will only become more discouraged. Jesus never feared the questions others posed. He was patient with Thomas, the woman at the well, and the father who cried out, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief, in Mark 9, 24. He will also be patient with us. Wonder and vulnerability go hand in hand as we open ourselves up to seeing God move. We can't let the storms of life make us numb to the depth of struggle we feel. By doing so, the hope of heaven seems less real, less awesome. When we try to harden our hearts to present a false stability, we forget to seek healing for our pain. Like Aaliyah Joy says in her book, Glorious Weakness, so often when we are hurting in the church, we put our masks back on and pretend everything is fine because we think our testimony is supposed to be our faithfulness. But our testimony is only ever how God is faithful to us, not the other way around. We are not saved to pretend we are perfect, but redeemed by the righteous one, for His glory. The great news is that Jesus saw us as worth saving. When we bring all of who we are to Him and His purposes, we see deliverance reach into our darkest places. He is faithful to meet, comfort, and heal us in the midst of the mess, and that should lead us to awe. That awe then sets us free to dream kingdom dreams. We too often limit God with our own imagination in our prayers, our lives, and our hopes for the future. 
God cares about the desires of our hearts, and even our smallest dreams are seen by Him. But self-focused dreams are often insufficient to act as a catalyst for lasting wonder. In contrast, kingdom dreams seek to reach past this temporary life and into the eternal. Dreams of seeing the good news preached, broken hearts bound up, and captives set free should inspire our goals and hopes for our life. When we seek these things, we are given the divine privilege of watching our God at work. We should take the time to answer the questions Michael Iaconelli asks in the book Dangerous Wonder. He says, shouldn't Christians be known by the fire in their souls? the wide-eyed gratitude in their faces, the twinkle in their eyes, and a holy mischief in their demeanors? Shouldn't Christianity be considered dangerous, unpredictable, threatening to the status quo, living outside the lines, uncontrollable, fearless, wild, beyond categorization or definition? Shouldn't those who call themselves Christians be filled with awe, astonishment, and amazement? Okay, so far we have looked up at God and into our internal secret places, but we also need to look outside if we want to find the joy available from seeing God. And when I say outside, I mean this literally. The more entertainment there is at our fingertips, the easier it is to stay indoors. Stepping outside summons wonder because the creativity color, and power that exist in creation forces us to see outside of ourselves. When we gaze out into the heights of the sky and the depths of the oceans, we sense how much is vastly out of our reach, our control, or our understanding. We try to allow our troubles to be whisked away by these grand aspects of creation, and the longer we look at how they declare the glory of God, the more tension within us begins to release. There is freedom in knowing we are not the center of the universe. Job 12, 7-10 lets us into the mind of a man deep in sorrow, but still filled with wonder. It says, But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. It is possible to spend our whole day with screens instead of sunshine. Let's step outside instead of beginning the next television binge. Yes, we should be thankful for our shelters and heated homes if we have them, but a breath of fresh air along a windy trail through the hills will help us enjoy the God who created it all. John 1, 3 says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Witnessing the blessing of a blue sky, the peace of branches swaying in the wind, or wading up into the night so that we can gaze at the wondrous star-accented beauty that He hung in the sky can remind us of how big our God is, and it breathes thankfulness into our deflated souls. Thankfulness is more powerful than we realize. Look around you. What would you be sad to lose? When we realize God's good gifts are as near as our very breath, that every breath is a good gift, our hearts begin to swell with thankfulness. Do not wait till you have lost something you cherish to be thankful. Start the practice of looking around each day and telling God, thank you, as you take notice of the blessings he's placed in your path. 
Discontentment is a quick and brutal thief of awe because it drags us away from acknowledging the blessings that surround us. Even when these blessings are hard to spot, they are there. Salvation, eternal life, a place in the family of God, and the Spirit of God are all given to every believer and cannot be taken by circumstances or trials. They are part of who we are forever. As Hebrews 12.28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. We will be receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, which is great news when death, sickness, and broken emotions fill our stories. The reality is we currently live in this fallen world riddled with the consequences of sin and rebellion towards God. And sometimes we don't get to see the healing we want for others or ourselves. But we serve a God who knows what perfect healing looks like. And even when we do not receive what we want this side of heaven, someday that healing and satisfaction will come. Gerald May made the observation that in our society, we have come to believe that discomfort always means something is wrong. We are conditioned to believe that feelings of distress, pain, deprivation, yearning, and longing mean something is wrong with the way we are living our lives. Conversely, we are convinced that a rightly lived life must give us serenity, completion, and fulfillment. Comfort means right, and distress means wrong. The influence of such convictions is stifling the human spirit. Individually and collectively, we must somehow recover the truth. The truth is, we were never meant to be completely satisfied. We were never meant to be completely satisfied in our society because it is not our society. When we know that our citizenship is in heaven, we can find the secret to being content in Jesus and that His grace is sufficient, His joy is our strength, and the abundant life of freedom is offered to us here and now. This is the worst it will ever get for us. This is the closest to hell a believer will ever get. 1 Corinthians fifteen, fifty three says, This perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the promise. Victory is our eternal home. We seek God, hope in God, and wait for God as we praise Him for all He has done and will do. We follow the example of the psalmist in Psalm 103, 2-5. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? Jesus' kingdom meets us here and now in so many real ways. He helps us kill the sin that holds us back. He teaches us what it means to love Him. And He will lift our heads when we trip over well-intentioned plans for the journey we think we have figured out. There will be a day when we will truly have our eyes on Jesus, the one we look to each day in good or bad. Revelations 21, 3 and 4 says, God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he will who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. As we seek to marvel and stand in awe of our Savior, 
may our thoughts forever dwell on the truths of Ephesians 3, 20-21. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be the glory in the Church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Forever and ever, the Word says. This theme that runs through literature, poetry, and movies, that this life here is all there is, is so far away from the great hope we are designed to live in. Ralph Waldo Emerson was one of those who said, Life is a journey, not a destination. And yes, as we've covered, we can learn as we live our individual journeys. We should always be praying that we remain teachable, see the beauty hidden in today. Yes, we should enjoy the journey on the way to where we are going. God has a reason for us to be here. We need to find it and live it. Yes, the journey is good, but the destination, no matter how good the journey is, the destination is infinitely better. It is better no question. Heaven awaits. Heaven awaits. But let us live our lives so that when we get there, we hear our Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's live well, people. Let's risk loving, risk stepping out in faith, risk having the courage to hope. And may the source of our hope be none other than our wonderful Jesus. Father God, thank you that your great and wonderful plan includes us. That because of the faith given to us through your Son, we will get to be with you forever and ever. Please increase the wonder and awe in our lives. Help us to love you more and enjoy you more. Let us live in the light that heaven awaits us. And may the power of that truth overflow into our journeys and empower us to share your message with all those who need to hear. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Thanks for joining me today as we dreamed of the future and marveled in the majesty of our great God. The resources, books, and articles referred to can be found in the show notes at lifeaudio.com slash podcast or on iTunes. We'd love if you would rate and review this podcast so others can find us. Until next time, may you seek the abundant life Jesus died to give and live in the truth that sets people free. Amen.